The Consoling Thoughts of St. Francis de Sales Consoling Thoughts on Our Trials of an Interior Life, Infirmities of Soul and Body, etc. Chapter 11 Trials in Prayer Prayer illumines our understanding with the divine light and lays open our will to the holy flames of celestial love. Nothing so much purifies our mind from its errors or our will from its depraved affections. It is a water of benediction, which makes the plants of our good desires grow green again and flourish, satiates the thirst of our hearts, and allays the heat of irregular concupiscence. That uneasiness you experience at prayer, and which is joined with a great anxiety to discover some object capable of arresting and contenting your mind, is alone sufficient to prevent you from finding what you seek. When we search for anything with too much eagerness, we pass it by a hundred times without perceiving it. The result of this vain and useless anxiety is weariness of mind, hence coldness and torpor of soul. I know not what remedies you should use, but if you can possibly prevent this solicitude, you will do a good work. Devotion cannot meet a more pestiferous enemy. It takes the semblance of endeavoring to excite us towards virtue, but only in order to cool us and makes us run, but to overthrow us. We must then guard against excessive ardor on all occasions, but particularly in prayer. To assist you in this, you should remember that the graces and favors of prayer are not earthly, but heavenly waters, which all our efforts cannot acquire, but for which indeed we must dispose ourselves with humble and tranquil care. We must hold up our heart open to heaven and await the sacred dew, and never forget to carry this consideration to prayer, that therein we approach to God and do so for two principal reasons. The first is to render to God the honor and homage which we owe Him, and this can be done without His speaking to us or our speaking to Him, acknowledging by our presence that He is our God, and we His vile creatures, and remaining prostrate in spirit before Him, awaiting His commands. How many courtiers are there who appear a hundred times before the king, not to speak to Him or hear Him, but simply to be seen by Him? and to testify by their assiduity that they are his servants. This motive of presenting ourselves before God merely to attest our engagement in his service is most pure, worthy, and excellent, and consequently of the highest perfection. The second reason for which we come before God is to speak to him and to hear him speak to us by his inspirations and interior motions. And this is usually performed with a delicious pleasure, because it is a great happiness to speak to so mighty a Lord. And when he answers, he is accustomed to pour out such precious balm and unction as fill the soul to overflowing with sweetness. One of these reasons may sometimes fail us, but both never. If we can speak to our Lord, let us speak to him, praise him, beseech him, listen to him. If we cannot, because we are hoarse, let us remain in his chamber and pay him reverence. He will observe us there, regard our patience, and be pleased with our silence. Another time we shall be amazed when he takes us by the hand and shows us everything, making a hundred turns along the beautiful walks of the garden of prayer. But even if he should never do so, we ought to be content with fulfilling our duty of accompanying his suite, and consider that it is already too great an honor for him to endure us in his presence. Note, quote, A soul should not resolve, on account of the drynesses it experiences, to abandon prayer even though its trials continue always. It should regard them as a very profitable cross to carry in the footsteps of its Savior, who invisibly assists it. We cannot lose anything in the company of so good a master, and the time will come when he will repay, with interest, our fidelity. Our Lord permits these and such like pains 
to happen to some persons in the beginning, and to others during the course of their exercises in prayer. The graces with which he intends to honor us, at last being so great, he wishes, first of all, to make us understand how vast is our misery, that we may be preserved from pride. End quote from St. Teresa. Back to the text. Put aside those heart-rending inquietudes, and no longer say that you can do nothing in prayer. What would you wish to do there but what you really do, which is to represent and offer to God your misery and nothingness? The most beautiful address that beggars make is to expose to our eyes their sores and their rags. But sometimes you will tell me you cannot even do so much as this, for you remain there as a shadow or a statue. Very well, that is just as good. In the palaces of kings there are statues arranged which serve only to recreate the royal vision. Be content, then, as one of these in the presence of God. He will animate this statue when he pleases. You ask me how you should act in order to carry your soul straight to God without looking to the right hand or to the left. The question is so much the more agreeable to me as it carries its answer along with it. You must do what you say. Go straight to God without looking to the right hand or to the left. This is not what you ask, I see, but how you should act in order so to establish your soul on God, that nothing may be able to detach it from Him. Two things are necessary for that, namely, to die and to be saved. No more separation, then, but your soul will be indissolubly attached and united to its God. You say that this is not yet what you ask, but how you should act in order to prevent the least trifle from withdrawing your soul from God, as only too often happens. You mean to say, I suppose, the least distraction. Well, you ought to know that the least trifle of a distraction cannot withdraw your soul from God, since nothing withdraws us from God but sin. And the resolution we make in the morning to keep our soul united to God and attentive to His presence has the effect of preserving us thus always, even when we sleep, since we do all in the name of God and according to His most holy will. Even venial sins are not capable of turning us aside from the way which conducts to God. They undoubtedly retard us a little on our course, but they do not turn us aside, much less simple distractions. So far as prayer is concerned, it is not less useful or less agreeable to God when accompanied with many distractions. On the contrary, it may be more useful than if we had many consolations, because it is more laborious, provided, however, that we have the wish to withdraw from those distractions and do not allow our mind to dwell on them willingly. The very same observation applies to the difficulty which, during the day, we feel to fix our mind on God and on heavenly things, provided we endeavor to keep our thoughts from running after trifles and learn patience by not growing weary of our labor, which is suffered for the love of God. We must distinguish between God and a perception of God, between faith and a feeling of faith. A person about to suffer martyrdom for God does not always think of God at that time, and though he has no feeling of faith, yet he does not cease to merit or to perform an act of the greatest love. It is the same with the presence of God. We must content ourselves with considering that he is our God, and we are his weak creatures, unworthy of that honor. Thus St. Francis spent a whole night saying to God, Who art thou, O Lord, and who am I? He who, in praying to God, perceives that he prays, is not perfectly attentive to prayer, for he turns away his attention from God to think on the prayer which he offers. Even the care that we have not to have distractions is often a very great distraction. 
simplicity in spiritual actions is their most commendable quality. Would you wish to behold God? Behold Him, then, and be attentive to that. For if you begin to reflect and to examine how you look yourself while you are looking on Him, it is no longer God you are viewing, but yourself. He who is occupied in fervent prayer pays no attention as to whether he is engaged in prayer or not, for he thinks not of the prayer which he makes, but of God to whom he makes it. He who burns with the ardor of sacred love does not recall his heart to consider what it does, but keeps it fixed on God, employed in loving him, with whose love it is consumed. The heavenly chorister takes so much pleasure in pleasing his God that he finds no pleasure in the melody of his voice, unless because it pleases his God. Here ends the reading, and thanks be to God.